I'm a photographer, and for years, I've traveled to the far corners of the world, capturing landscapes, portraits, and moments that tell stories. But lately, I've felt uninspired, as if I've hit a creative wall. I need something different, something that challenges me. That's why I find myself flipping through an old book on mythical and mysterious places around the world. When I come across a section about the ghost forest, something clicks. I know I have to go there. I do my research, poring over articles, blogs, and forums. The ghost forest is famous, or perhaps infamous, for its twisted, gnarled trees that seem to defy the laws of nature. People talk about the forest's eerie atmosphere. Some even say it's haunted, though evidence is anecdotal at best. Planning the trip takes a couple of weeks. It's a remote area, not easily accessible, and there are no nearby accommodations. I'll have to camp out, which means I need to prepare carefully. My packing list is extensive. Camera equipment, camping gear, food supplies, and, after some consideration, a first aid kit and a flare gun. You never know what might happen in a place called the Ghost Forest. The drive to the forest is long and tiring, but my excitement only grows with each mile. I listen to a podcast about the legends and myths surrounding the forest, allowing the stories to fuel my imagination. Finally, after hours on the road, I see the sign, Ghost Forest, two miles. My heart skips a beat. I pull into the makeshift parking area, a mere indentation in the earth next to the trailhead. I'm the only car here, which is both a relief and a concern. On one hand, I'll have the forest to myself, free to explore without interruption. On the other hand, being alone in a place like this could be risky. I shake off the thought. I've done this sort of thing before, after all. I unload my gear, lock the car, and make my way toward the trail that leads into the forest. Each step feels like a descent into another world. The air grows cooler, the light dims, and the trees, those twisted, gnarled trees, begin to appear. They're even more surreal in person. I can't help but marvel at them, even as a sense of unease begins to creep in. I find a suitable spot to set up camp, just off the trail and surrounded by the most twisted trees I can find. The tent is up in no time, and I secure my food supplies in a bear-proof container. With everything set up, I grab my camera gear and head deeper into the forest, eager to start shooting before the light fades. I find an area in the forest that grabs my attention immediately. The trees here are noticeably twisted, as if sculpted by an artist. The leaves are a deep, almost inky shade of green, contrasting starkly with the sky above. Speaking of the sky, it's the kind that photographers dream of capturing at twilight, filled with clouds that are just sparse enough to promise a dynamic, colorful sunset. I waste no time setting up my equipment. I extend the legs of my tripod, making sure they are securely anchored on the uneven forest floor. My camera clicks satisfyingly into place atop the tripod. I fiddle with the settings, adjusting the ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. My goal is to catch the fading light in a way that does justice to this unique environment. With everything set up, I start my photography session. My first point of focus is the intricate texture of the tree bark close to me. Through the lens, the bark takes on an almost otherworldly quality, filled with intricate patterns and grooves. I snap a few shots, the camera making a satisfying click with each one. Next, I zoom out to frame the wider scene. The branches of these twisted trees seem to stretch and contort in various directions. It's as if they are reaching for something, although what that something is remains elusive. The lens captures this sense of yearning, this palpable tension in the way the branches arc and twist. By this time, the sun is on its descent, transforming the sky into a canvas of orange and purple hues. I glance at my camera's screen to review the shots and am stunned by the richness of the colors. The warm glow of the setting sun casts the trees in soft light, while the sky above provides a dramatic backdrop. Realizing the light is changing rapidly, I quickly adjust the camera's exposure settings. I want to capture the growing shadows that are starting to fill the spaces between the trees. 
As I take a few more shots, I notice that the lighting conditions are lending an almost surreal quality to the images. The forest looks both inviting and ominous in these conditions. I take a moment to step back and absorb the scene with my own eyes. The forest is quiet, except for the occasional rustle of leaves and distant calls of evening birds. It's a stillness that feels almost sacred, amplifying the sense of enchantment that I feel. The sun finally dips below the horizon, leaving the forest shrouded in shadows. The trees, once vibrant in the daylight, now stand as dark silhouettes against the dimming sky. The atmosphere has shifted, the forest feels denser and more mysterious. I adjust my camera settings to adapt to the change. I switch to longer exposures, hoping to capture the delicate balance between the scant light filtering through the canopy and the ever-growing darkness on the ground. I position my camera to frame a particularly intriguing cluster of trees. Their branches are interwoven in a way that almost looks intentional. I press the shutter button. The camera lens stays open for several seconds, gathering as much light as it can before it clicks shut. I repeat this process a few more times, each time adjusting the angle or the focus slightly to get a range of shots. Curious to see how the photos are turning out, I toggle to the review function on my camera's screen. The colors are muted, but the interplay of light and shadow gives the images a hauntingly beautiful quality. But then, I see something that chills me. Blurry figures are visible in the background of the frames, standing among the trees. I zoom in on the figures, my fingers nervously tapping the zoom button. They are indistinct, but undeniably humanoid in shape. My mind races. I'm certain these figures were not present when I composed and took the shots. Must be a trick of the light, I say to myself. But I feel a creeping sense of unease, like cold fingers running down my spine. My first instinct is to rationalize the figures as some kind of optical illusion caused by the dwindling light. But then another thought crosses my mind. Could it be a technical glitch? Cameras are sensitive devices. They can sometimes produce anomalies, especially in challenging lighting conditions. I navigate through the camera menu and perform a quick sensor cleaning, hoping that might solve the issue. Despite these rational explanations, I can't shake the feeling that something is off. My hands are a little shaky as I reposition the camera for the next set of shots. I take a deep breath, reminding myself that I'm an experienced photographer and have dealt with unexpected challenges before. I set my focus on capturing more shots, but this time with a heightened awareness of the background. I take a moment to examine my surroundings carefully, squinting to make out details in the growing darkness. The forest is still, and I see no signs of wildlife or people. Confident that I'm alone, I aim the camera at another group of twisted trees, ensuring that a large portion of the background is visible in the frame. My finger hesitates for a moment before pressing the shutter button. I let the camera process the images, my heart pounding in anticipation as I switch to the review screen. The blurry figures are still there, but now they appear more defined, almost as if they are closer than before. The shapes are undeniably human, but there's an unsettling quality to them, like shadows given form. This doesn't make sense, I mutter, my words puncturing the quiet that has settled over the forest. As if in response to my disbelief, a sudden chill envelops me. It feels like the temperature has dropped, but the cold I feel seems to penetrate deeper, right into my bones. It's accompanied by an unsettling sensation that I'm being observed, that the stillness of the forest is deceptive. Summoning courage, I raise my voice. Hello? Is anyone there? My words seem to hang in the air for a moment before they disperse, echoing faintly through the maze of trees. I listen intently, half expecting to hear a voice or footsteps, but my call is met with absolute silence. The stillness that follows is unnerving. The forest, which had felt so captivating in the sunlight, now feels oppressive in the darkness. The charm it held is replaced by a menacing quality that makes me seriously consider leaving. I look at my camera and tripod, 
contemplating whether to pack them up and retreat to the safety of my campsite or car. The internal debate rages within me. The rational part of me argues for packing up and leaving. It's not worth the risk to stay in a place that is beginning to feel increasingly hostile. But the adventurer in me, the photographer who lives for the thrill of capturing the extraordinary, urges me to stay and explore the mystery that is unfolding before my lens. With my heart pounding, I make a decisive move. I switch my camera to timer mode, setting it for a 10 second delay to give myself time to move into the frame. I position the camera at a low angle, aiming to capture a broad view of the forest behind me. The lens is wide open, ready to encompass both me and the mysterious background. I press the shutter button and quickly walk into the designated spot in the frame. I stand still and listen for the sound of the shutter. A moment later, it clicks. My steps back to the camera are hesitant but quick. I feel a mix of dread and excitement as I approach the camera's screen. I take a deep breath to steady myself before hitting the review button. And there it is. An unmistakable, shadowy figure positioned just a few feet behind where I was standing. The figure appears almost solid, yet retains an ethereal quality, like a wisp of darkness given form. I'm not alone, I whisper to myself. The words seem to hang in the air, as if the forest itself is listening. I'm definitely not alone. The feeling of being watched intensifies, almost as if the forest, or whatever inhabits it, is aware of my discovery. My mind races with possibilities. Intrigue battles with unease within me, each emotion vying for control. I ponder whether to pack up or investigate further. I start disassembling my equipment. My hands shake as I retract the tripod's legs, the metal clinking louder than I remember it ever sounding. I detach the camera from its mount, quickly turning it off to conserve its remaining battery life. I open my camera bag and begin to stow away my gear, trying to fit everything back into its designated slot. I reach into my pocket for my car keys, expecting to feel the cold metal against my fingertips. Instead, my fingers find only the empty pocket lining. I check my other pockets, even though I'm sure that's where I always keep them. Still nothing. I desperately dump out the contents of my camera bag onto the forest floor, sifting through lenses, cleaning cloths, and spare batteries. The keys are nowhere to be found. A feeling of acute panic rises in my throat. My car keys are missing, effectively stranding me in a darkening forest where inexplicable things are happening. I scan the area around me, wondering if I might have dropped the keys while setting up or taking pictures. I even look under the bush where I hid my equipment, but my search yields nothing. I weigh my options quickly. It's too risky to stay here, especially now that darkness is enveloping the forest. I make a tough decision. I decide to head back on foot. I remember the trail isn't too far from the main road. A hike back in the dark isn't ideal, but it's my only option right now. As I walk back, the forest is becoming a darker hue as the last remnants of daylight fade away. I know this should be the same trail that led me into the forest, but an unsettling feeling gnaws at me. The path now seems to stretch longer than before. I reach into my pocket for my phone. The screen comes to life with a reassuring glow, and I see the battery indicator shows it's fully charged. Just when I'm about to tap on the Maps application, the unthinkable happens. The screen abruptly goes black. I press the power button, tap the screen, and even try a hard reset, but it remains lifeless. My initial concern transforms into an acute sense of dread. As I push ahead, the ambient sounds of the forest are accompanied by something new, soft whispers that drift in with the wind. At first, they are so faint that I wonder if my mind is playing tricks on me. But as I keep walking, the whispers grow in volume and clarity. They become distinguishable as human voices, yet the words they're saying remain unintelligible. The whispers seem to swirl around me, coming from no specific direction. Then, another layer of sound joins the whispers. Footsteps. 
These are not the random crunches of forest creatures. They are light but purposeful, creating a rhythm that seems to mirror my own steps. My heart pounds as I quickly turn around to identify the source of these sounds. My eyes search the spaces between the trees, the underbrush, and the shadows that fill the forest. Despite my thorough search, there's no sign of anyone or anything that could be making the sounds. Eventually, I find myself stepping into a clearing. It's as if the forest has opened up to provide a brief break from its suffocating embrace. The moon, now higher in the sky, casts its silvery light onto the clearing, illuminating a small pond in the middle. The water is so still that it serves as a near-perfect mirror. But what truly captures my attention is an object near the pond. It's an altar of sorts, crude but clearly fashioned with intent. It stands by the water's edge, constructed from rocks and branches. The altar is marked with symbols. Then my eyes catch something metallic glinting in the moonlight, just above the altar. As I focus, I realize it's a set of car keys hanging from a branch. Not just any keys, but my car keys. A flood of relief washes over me, momentarily eclipsing the fear. But as quickly as the relief comes, it's accompanied by a renewed sense of terror. The pressing question fills my mind. How did my keys get here, hanging ominously above this altar? I scan the clearing once more, my eyes darting between the trees that surround the open space. I'm searching for any sign of life, any indication that I'm being watched. But the clearing remains empty, and I'm enveloped by a silence that feels heavy with anticipation. Summoning the courage, I approach the altar. Each step is cautious, almost reverent, but driven by an overwhelming need to reclaim my keys. I reach up, my fingers trembling as they close around the cold metal. The second the keys are in my hand, something extraordinary happens. The whispers that filled the air and the footsteps that echoed behind me cease instantly. It's as if the forest, or whatever dwells within it, was waiting for this very moment. Clasping the keys tightly, I pivot and dash back toward the trail. My footsteps are hurried, almost stumbling, the forest around me is no longer just a backdrop for my growing list of unsettling experiences. It feels like an entity, active and aware, shaping the events that are unfolding. Even with my keys back in my possession, the eerie sensation that I'm not alone persists. The forest seems to buzz with an energy, a life force that is both alien and unsettling. I make my way back to the trail. My ears are attuned to any sound, be it the rustle of leaves or the distant hoot of an owl, as I navigate through the forest. The sensation of being watched still lingers, making the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Despite this, I press on, driven by the need to put as much distance as possible between me and the clearing with the altar. My pace quickens as I recognize certain landmarks, a distinctive boulder, and a fork in the trail indicating that I'm getting closer to where I parked my car. The forest seems less menacing now, almost as if it's pulling back, loosening its grip on me. Then finally, I see it. The outline of my car emerging from the darkness, bathed in the soft glow of the moonlight. Relief washes over me in a tidal wave, momentarily washing away the tension that has built up. I reach the car, my fingers trembling as I insert the key into the lock. It turns smoothly, and I hear the satisfying click as the door unlocks. I slide into the driver's seat of my car, my fingers wrapping tightly around the steering wheel. The texture of the wheel feels reassuring, grounding me in a reality that has recently seemed anything but stable. A wave of relief sweeps over me, so strong it's almost a physical sensation. I'm desperate to distance myself from the bizarre occurrences in the forest, to leave behind the shadowy figures and unexplained whispers. I reach for the ignition, my key poised to start the car and make my escape. But just as I'm about to turn the key, I stop. My peripheral vision detects movement outside the car windows. As I focus, I see shapes forming in the darkness, coalescing into figures that skirt the edge of visibility. They appear human, or at least humanoid, 
but their outlines waver as if struggling to maintain form. It's as though the very darkness is manifesting into these beings, materializing them from the night itself. Pushing down the fear that surges through me, I snap into action. I turn the key, and the engine comes alive with a growl, breaking the stifling silence. With no room for hesitation, I slam my foot onto the gas pedal. The car responds immediately, lurching forward as its tires crunch over the gravel of the forest road. I'm moving, finally putting distance between me and whatever entities are haunting this place. As I navigate the winding road, I can't resist glancing at my rearview mirror. My stomach tightens at what I see. The figures are still there, and they're following me. Impossibly, they seem to keep pace with the speeding car, moving in a way that defies logic. It's as if they're not bound by the rules that govern the natural world, gliding effortlessly over the ground to maintain their pursuit. My mind whirls with a blend of disbelief and terror as I grip the steering wheel even more firmly, my knuckles turning a shade lighter. In a surge of panic, fueled by desperation, I make a hasty choice to swerve off the road. My thinking is the sudden maneuver will shake them off. The car veers sharply, tires screeching as they lose their grip on the asphalt. But my snap decision doesn't yield the result I'm hoping for. Instead, the car skids uncontrollably off the road and comes to a jarring stop as it nosedives into a ditch. The front bumper grinds against the soil, embedding itself in the earth. I slam the gear into reverse, gunning the engine in a futile attempt to back out. The wheels spin wildly but achieve nothing, kicking up chunks of dirt and tufts of grass into the air. I notice the figures are still approaching, their shapes becoming more distinct as they close the gap. My heartbeat pounds in my ears, drowning out the sound of the idling engine and the night creatures in the forest. It's a defining moment, a point of no return. My mind goes to an old flare gun I keep stashed in the glove compartment, a precautionary item I never believed I'd have to use. I lunge toward the glove compartment and flip it open. There, lying beneath a mess of old maps and car manuals, is the flare gun. With shaking hands, I grasp the flare gun and scramble out of the car. Standing beside the stuck vehicle, I raise the gun, aim it toward the sky, and pull the trigger. A sharp whoosh cuts through the night air as the flare shoots upwards, its blazing light unfurling like a fiery banner against the sky. For a moment, the forest is awash in a harsh, revealing light, each tree and shadow sharply outlined in a surreal tableau. The effect on the figures is immediate and startling. They recoil as if jolted by an electric shock, retreating into the deeper shadows beyond the flare's reach. It's as though the burst of light has exerted a physical force, scattering them into the hidden recesses of the forest. Capitalizing on this brief window of opportunity, I lunge back into the driver's seat. The figures have scattered, if only for a moment, and this might be my only chance to escape. I slam my foot onto the accelerator with all the force I can muster. The engine roars and the wheels grind against the dirt beneath them. To my immense relief, the car jolts free, lurching out of the ditch and back onto the solid ground of the road. This time, I make no attempt to check the rearview mirror. My entire focus is on the stretch of road in front of me, on widening the gap between me and the mysterious figures. My foot remains glued to the gas pedal, pressing it as far down as it will go. The car surges forward, eating up the distance as I speed away from the nightmarish forest. I only begin to ease up on the gas when the forest starts to thin out, giving way to open fields and the first signs of civilization. As I put more and more miles between myself and the forest, a torrent of conflicting emotions sweeps through me. There's relief, of course, a profound sense of gratitude that I've managed to escape whatever malevolent forces are at play. But intermingled with that relief is a deep-seated confusion about the nature of what just happened. The events defy explanation, challenging the very foundations of what I understand to be real and possible. Adding another layer to my emotional state is a chilling sense of dread, an unsettling realization that I've likely stumbled upon something far larger and more incomprehensible than I can fathom. 
The specifics of what that something might be elude me, but the general sense that I've brushed against an unknown, perhaps even supernatural phenomenon is undeniable. Eventually, I pull into the driveway of my home, my car's tires crunching over the gravel as I park. I turn off the engine and sit still for a moment, gripping the steering wheel. My hands are still trembling. I finally gather the energy to step out of the car. I unlock the door and step inside, immediately bolting it behind me. My fingers flick the light switch, and the room is flooded with illumination. A part of me half expects to see the shadowy figures from the forest standing in my living room. But the space is empty, just as I left it this morning, with the furniture neatly arranged and no sign of intrusion. The normal surroundings of my home feel almost surreal in their ordinariness. I make my way into the living room and sink into the couch, my camera bag still draped over my shoulder. The fabric of the sofa is soft and familiar, but the comfort it usually provides feels distant, overshadowed by the unresolved tension that lingers in my mind. For a long stretch of time, I just sit there, staring blankly at the opposite wall. My mind is endlessly replaying the events of the night in a loop. The walls of my home now feel like they're closing in on me. Collecting myself, I decided to look at the photos I captured earlier. I unzip the camera bag and retrieve my camera, feeling a rush of anxiety as I power it on. My fingers navigate to the gallery, and I start scrolling through the images. But something's wrong. The shadowy figures that had been in the photos while I was in the forest are now missing. In their place, the photos show just the forest itself, its gnarled trees and twisted branches captured in haunting detail. It's as if some unseen hand has edited them out, rewriting the digital version of reality to align with the natural world I had intended to photograph in the first place. The relief is short-lived, however, as I reach the final photo in the gallery. What I see sends a new jolt of unease through me. The photo shows my car, its taillights glowing, speeding away from the dark expanse of the forest. But there's a problem. I didn't take this photo. I was alone and driving, so how could I? The angle of the shot is all wrong. It's taken from an elevated position, as if someone was up in the trees, looking down at my vehicle. Who or what took this photo? The camera feels heavy in my hands. My mind races, wrestling with questions that have no straightforward answers. I set the camera down on the coffee table. For a long moment, I just sit there, contemplating my next move. I could dig deeper, could try to unravel the inexplicable events that unfolded in the ghost forest. But as I replay the night's occurrences, I realize that some mysteries are better left unsolved. My decision solidifies in that moment. I won't go back to that forest. Whatever is lurking there, whether it's a natural anomaly, a collection of restless spirits, or something else entirely, it's clear that I've ventured too close to a realm I don't understand. The risk, both to my sanity and my physical well-being, is too great. I rise from the couch and walk over to my computer. Pulling up my photo management software, I transfer the pictures from the camera. Once they're safely stored, I delete them from the camera's memory card. I shut down the computer and head upstairs to bed, but I know that sleep will be elusive tonight. As I lie in bed staring at the ceiling, the events of the night replay in my mind. I close my eyes, embracing the decision to leave some questions unanswered, to let the ghost forest keep its secrets. And with that thought, I finally slip into sleep, putting an end to a night that I'll never forget, yet never revisit. The morning sunlight spills into my small kitchen, painting the room in hues of gold. I'm cradling my steaming mug of strong coffee, my eyes still half shut against the early morning hours. Stepping out of my apartment, I make my way toward the local coffee shop for my usual breakfast treat a ham and cheese croissant, lightly toasted. The barista, a lively woman named Emma, greets me with a warm smile. Morning, Thomas. The usual? Yes, please, I reply, returning her smile. 
As I wait for my order, I scan the coffee shop out of habit, my gaze sweeping across the familiar faces of regulars and a few new ones. That's when I spot him. A man, standing in the corner, wearing a crisp gray suit. His face is plain, almost forgettable, but his eyes, they're locked on me. Not threateningly, but there's an intent there that I can't quite decipher. I stiffen, and a chill crawls up my spine. Shaking off the feeling, I tell myself it's nothing more than a mere coincidence. After all, we're in a coffee shop. People look at other people all the time. It's normal, right? I take my croissant from Emma, offering her a small, distracted smile before heading to the school. The sight of the kids flooding the courtyard, their chatter filling the air, eases the tension in my shoulders. As the day unfolds, I slide into my teaching mode, diving into lessons about Revolutionary War heroes and the Pythagorean theorem. It's all standard until lunch when I spot him again. The man in the gray suit, standing on the other side of the school fence, watching me. It's like a bucket of ice water has been dumped on me, that same unsettling feeling gripping me tighter. The sandwich in my hand loses its appeal, and I can't shake off the nagging sense of unease. The rest of the day passes in a blur. I am present but distracted, my thoughts always returning to the man in the gray suit. His image burns itself into my mind. Once home, I slump into my armchair, my heart heavy in my chest. I turn it over in my mind, the memory of the man in the gray suit. I still write it off as a coincidence. But as the sun sets and the room fills with shadows, I can't shake off the nagging feeling that it's not a coincidence. The next day brings a vibrant sunrise, the sky painted in hues of orange and pink. As I sip my coffee, I can't help but feel a sense of unease creep in. The events of yesterday are fresh in my mind, the image of the man in the gray suit is still haunting me. I push away the unease, determined to focus on my day. I spend the morning hours immersed in lessons, and the lively discussion between the students about American history brings a smile to my face. By lunchtime, I've nearly forgotten the unsettling encounter. But as I leave the school premises for my usual lunch at a local deli, I see him again. My heart pounds in my chest. He's across the street, standing in the shadow of a towering office building. Wearing the same gray suit, only today, it seems sharper and more formal. His hair is neatly combed back, a shade of brown so ordinary that it would have been forgettable if not for the circumstances. The lines on his face suggest he's probably in his late thirties, but his eyes look older and more experienced. They are a deep blue, almost gray. They watch me, just like yesterday, with an unnerving intensity. His jaw is set firm and his stance is rigid. There's something incredibly methodical about him. He holds a newspaper in his hand, but his attention is clearly focused on me. A chill runs down my spine. There's no mistaking it this time. He's not just a man in a gray suit. He's the man in the gray suit, the same man from yesterday. Seeing him again, in a different location but with the same unwavering gaze, I can't ignore it anymore. The coincidences are piling up too high to disregard. I'm being watched. As I step back into the school, the noise of the playground does nothing to drown out the silence that the man in the gray suit leaves in his wake. Over the next few days, the man in the gray suit becomes a recurring figure in the backdrop of my daily life. Every morning, he's there in the coffee shop, standing in the corner, his gaze fixed on me. Each time, I feel that same sense of surprise, followed by a sinking feeling of dread. At lunch, I spot him near the school premises. He's always just out of reach, standing on the other side of the road, or down the street a bit. He never interacts, just observes. His appearances are starting to disturb me, disrupting the flow of my lessons and taking a toll on my appetite. The park is where I usually jog to clear my head, but now, even that is invaded. As I round the bend of my usual route one evening, my breath catches in my throat. There. On a bench under the glow of a lamppost sits the man in the gray suit. He's engrossed in a book, but as I pass by, 
he looks up and meets my gaze. It feels like a silent acknowledgement of this peculiar relationship we share. Even in the supermarket, while I'm engrossed in comparing cereal brands, I spot him. He's at the end of the aisle, his cart empty. He isn't shopping, just standing there, watching me. It's relentless, this surveillance. Everywhere I go, no matter how mundane or trivial the location, the man in the gray suit appears, his presence a constant reminder of my unwanted paranoia. His demeanor never changes, he's always calm and always observing. The gray suit, the watchful eyes, the silent presence, they've all become hauntingly familiar. Each day, I write about these encounters in my journal, a desperate attempt to make sense of the unfolding situation. The words gray suit appear so many times, they start to lose their meaning. It's the middle of the night, and I can't sleep. The thought of the man in the gray suit continues to haunt me. Seeking answers, I turn to my laptop, the screen's glow illuminating the room in an eerie light. Typing with a sense of urgency, I dive into the depths of the internet, searching for anyone who might share a similar experience. In the search bar, I type in a jumbled mix of words, hoping to find something, anything. Man in gray suit following me, being stalked by a man in a suit, constant observer, gray suit. The search results are an overwhelming mix of irrelevant articles, stalking laws, and links to suit stores. It's frustrating, sifting through the mess of information, finding nothing that resonates with my experience. Just when despair is about to set in, a forum link catches my attention. For those feeling watched, it reads. The title piques my curiosity. As I click on the forum link, a web page with a plain black background loads, filled with numerous thread titles that read like a catalog of paranoia. Being followed, need advice, man in suit always around. Is anyone else experiencing this? Each one seems to be a cry for help. A thread titled Gray Suit Syndrome catches my attention. The color matches, and the term syndrome suggests a shared experience. With a click, I dive into the thread. I'm met with a detailed account written by Nighthawk93. It reads, Hello, I've never done anything like this before, but I feel like I'm going crazy and I don't know where else to turn. It's about this man, a man in a gray suit. I first noticed him a couple of weeks ago at a coffee shop. He was sitting in a corner, seemingly minding his own business. But I noticed he kept watching me, his gaze never wavering. I brushed it off as a mere coincidence at first, but then I started seeing him everywhere. He was at the grocery store when I was shopping, outside my office building when I left work, and even at the park when I took my usual morning jog. He's always there, like a shadow I can't shake off. His presence is always passive, he never approaches or interacts. But his gaze, it's always fixed on me. I thought I was just being paranoid, but when I tried to confront him, he just walked away without saying a word. His constant, silent presence is getting under my skin, making me feel observed, studied, stalked. I can't help but feel this isn't random. It's too consistent, too persistent, and yet... It's too surreal. Who is he? Why is he always there? I don't have any enemies, no debts, no shady past. I'm just an average guy living an average life. So why me? And why a man in a gray suit? If anyone else has experienced anything similar or has any insights, please share. I feel lost and quite frankly scared. I just want to understand what's happening and hopefully find a way to stop it. Reading Nighthawk93's account, I can feel his fear seeping through the words, mirroring my own. The narrative mirror my own experiences, validating my fears while escalating them at the same time. I'm not alone in this ordeal, and somehow, that thought is more terrifying than comforting. I click on another thread titled, They're Always Watching, Anyone Else? My heartbeat picks up as I click on it, a sense of anticipation mixing with a growing dread. The post, authored by a user named Watchful Eye, is chillingly familiar. I don't know who they are, but they're always watching. I've noticed a man, always clad in a suit, 
appearing wherever I go. Mine wears a black suit, not gray, but I don't think that matters. He's there when I'm getting groceries, when I'm walking my dog, even when I'm alone in my house. I've seen him through my window, standing across the street, just watching. He never comes too close, never speaks, and never really does anything other than observe. But his constant presence is driving me to my wit's end. I can't eat, I can't sleep, I can't think straight. I've contacted the police, but they say without any real threatening behavior, they can't do anything. My friends think I'm paranoid. My own family is starting to doubt my sanity. So, I'm reaching out here, to this anonymous corner of the internet, hoping someone else is dealing with this, that I'm not losing my mind. If you've experienced anything similar, please let me know. Any advice, any insight is welcome. We need to figure this out together. Scrolling down from Watchful Eye's post, I start to read the comments. Moonlight85 writes, Same thing happening to me, man in a blue suit. No matter where I go, he's there, just watching. It's driving me crazy. Anxiety Strikes responds, I can't believe I'm reading this. I thought I was the only one. My suit is charcoal gray. Does anyone have any idea who they are or why they're doing this? Red Knight 20 adds, Guys, I think we're dealing with some sort of surveillance. But by who? Are we talking private investigators, some sick social experiment, or something more governmental? Free Spirit 007 suggests, Maybe we're part of some psychological study, unknowing participants in a bizarre research project? My once calm life is now filled with paranoia. The daily routine that I once took comfort in is now a source of distress. The effects bleed into my teaching. I find it hard to concentrate on lessons, my mind continually drifting to the man in the gray suit. My students notice, their faces painted with concern as they watch me pace restlessly in the classroom. One afternoon, during a particularly tense discussion about the Civil War, I spot him again. His silhouette, stark against the bright afternoon sun, stands out through the classroom window. I lose my train of thought mid-sentence, my words trailing off into an uncomfortable silence. Mr. Thompson? asks one of my students, a bright girl named Emily. Are you okay? I force a smile onto my face, struggling to regain my composure. I'm fine, Emily, just lost in thought. Now where were we? but my words don't seem to convince them. Whispers ripple through the classroom, and I see worried glances exchanged. My professional demeanor, the respect I've spent years building, it's starting to crumble. And it's not just my career that's suffering. My personal relationships bear the brunt of my obsession as well. Sarah, a close friend and colleague, confronts me one evening. Thomas, she says, her face lined with worry. You've changed. You're always distracted, always anxious. What's going on? I want to tell her, but how can I? How do I explain the constant fear, the unsettling presence of the man in the gray suit? How do I voice out the paranoia without sounding insane? I'm dealing with some things, Sarah, I manage to say. She gives me a long, hard look. Well, whatever it is, I'm here for you if you need me. I nod appreciating her concern. But inside, I know this isn't something I can share. Sitting in the dim light of my home office, I click on the bookmarked link to our forum, my nightly ritual before attempting sleep. My eyes scan over the threads. But tonight, a new thread stands out. The title sends a jolt of surprise through me. The truth, what's really happening, my hand feels oddly heavy as I maneuver the mouse to click on the link. The page loads to reveal a wall of text from a new user named Truthseeker101. The post reads, I've come across some alarming information, and I believe it's crucial that everyone here knows about it. After some deep digging, I've uncovered classified government files that reveal an ongoing psychological experiment. I've named it The Gray Suit Project. This experiment involves constant surveillance of unsuspecting citizens to observe their reactions and study their resulting behavior. If you've been feeling paranoid, 
watched, followed, it's because you are. Our encounters with the men in suits are not random, we're chosen subjects of this violation of our rights. I've attached some scans of these classified files below. I understand that their authenticity may be questionable, but the evidence is compelling. The redacted names, the purpose of the experiment, and the vague references to the suits all line up with our experiences. This goes beyond a simple violation of our privacy. It's an outright disregard for our civil rights and human dignity. We're not just observers or innocent bystanders. We're direct victims of a governmental intrusion that's dictating our lives. I won't stand for it, and neither should you. We need to expose this, make it public, and force them to stop this sick experiment. We can't let them toy with us like this. If there's any semblance of justice left, we need to fight for it. Clicking on the first link below the post, I'm taken to an image of a document, its edges lined with the rough imperfections of a quick scan. Top Secret Classified Information Department, Redacted Project Codename, The Gray Suit Project Objective, to understand citizen behavioral changes and psychological responses under prolonged surveillance conditions. Methodology Selected subjects will be closely monitored by specially trained operatives, suits. Suits will maintain a visible but distant presence, ensuring the subject's awareness of being watched. Data collection. Psychological profiles of the subjects will be updated bi-weekly based on observed behaviors and reactions. Key areas of interest include paranoia levels, changes in social behaviors, and alterations in routines. Duration. The duration of the experiment will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the observed behavioral changes and psychological reactions of each subject. Ethics Approval. Redacted. Date. Redacted. Signed. Redacted. I lean back in my chair, feeling the weight of what I've just read pressing down on me. I take a deep breath before I click on the next link. The image loads to reveal another document similar to the first, but with different details. Top Secret Classified Information Department, Redacted. Project code name: The Gray Suit Project. Subject Selection. Subjects are chosen based on a variety of factors, including but not limited to social influence, emotional resilience, and public visibility. Extreme care is taken to ensure subjects remain unaware of their selection, Suit Assignments. Each suit is assigned to a single subject. Suits are rigorously trained to blend into the background while maintaining a visible presence to their assigned subjects. Contingency Measures. In the event of a subject becoming aware of the experiment, protocol dictates a strict non-engagement policy. Suits are ordered to continue observation unless the subject poses a threat to the confidentiality of the project. In such cases, refer to redacted. Data handling. All data collected from the subjects is to be handled with utmost confidentiality. Bi-weekly reports are to be sent to redacted for analysis and further action. Public exposure. Risk. Redacted. Date. Redacted. Signed. Redacted. A new post from Truthseeker101 catches my eye. It's a separate thread, titled, Exposing the Truth. I click on it, my heart hammering against my ribs. The post reads, Thank you all for your comments and concerns on my previous thread. The reality of our situation is horrifying, but it's the truth, and we must face it head on. What's been revealed from these classified documents is a violation of every single one of our rights as citizens. We have become pawns in a game we didn't sign up for a silent experiment controlled by forces hidden behind the scenes. We've been violated and manipulated, our lives tampered with for data and research. This cannot continue. This must not continue. I have decided to take this public. It's a risk, I know, but if we do nothing, we allow them to win, to continue this monstrous experiment on us and who knows how many others. I have contacted a few trusted journalists who specialize in whistleblowing cases. I urge all of you to be cautious. Things might get more complicated from here, but remember, 
Knowledge is power. Now that we know what we're up against, we have a fighting chance. Let's use it. I'll update you as soon as I can. Stay strong. The next morning, I force myself out of bed. My laptop sits on the kitchen table, the forum page still open from last night. I sit down, my coffee going cold as I refresh the page, hoping to see a new post from Truthseeker. But there's nothing. I check again after my morning classes and again during lunch. Still nothing. A couple of days later, the speculation starts. One by one, the forum users chime in, their fear and anxiety spilling out in hastily typed messages. Silent Observer is the first to voice our collective dread. It's been three days. Three days and nothing from Truthseeker. Does anyone know anything? No, Greenfrog89 replies. I've messaged him multiple times, no response. Same here, I type back. I've reached out too, no reply. The forum buzzes with a tense energy as users begin to share their fears. The thread fills with speculations, each more alarming than the last. Theories range from Truthseeker being captured to him being a government plant all along. But the most chilling of all is the thought that maybe, just maybe, he's disappeared because he attempted to expose this horrifying government project. My days become a blur of anxiety and dread. At school, I can barely focus on my classes. I can't shake off the feeling of the man in the gray suit watching me. Every corner I turn, every crowd I walk through, I half expect to see him there. I start to lose weight. I don't sleep. Even in the comfort of my own home, I can't shake off the feeling of being watched. I stare at the man in the gray suit's usual spot across the street from my house. He's just standing there like always. One night, the walls of my house seem to close in on me. The constant nagging feeling of being watched presses down on me. I walk restlessly from room to room, an aimless pattern that has become all too familiar these past few days. My eyes keep drifting to my half-packed suitcase, lying open on my bed, a silent testament to my trapped existence. I sit down in front of my laptop, my fingers hovering over the keys, a simple search. One-way tickets. The result brings up a plethora of options. I could go anywhere and disappear into any city. But would it matter? Would they just assign a new suit to me? My heart hammers in my chest as I contemplate the idea. The thought of running away is both tempting and terrifying. On one hand, I could leave this all behind, maybe find some semblance of peace. On the other... I remember Truthseeker and his sudden, alarming disappearance. Would my attempt to escape bring about the same fate? I stare at the screen, at the countless options for escape. Yet, the fear of what might happen if I tried to run keeps me anchored in place, paralyzing me with its chilling grip. I sigh and close the browser tab. For now, escape remains a dream, an illusion of freedom that I can't afford to chase. Every morning I awake to a world that seems much the same as it was before, but I know it's different. I know it's changed, just as I have. I walk to work, taking the same path I always have, but I walk with a new awareness. Every glance over my shoulder, every face in the crowd, they could all be them, watching me. In the classroom, I stand before my students, teaching with the same passion as before. But there's a distance now a barrier constructed by my fear. I keep my interactions with others to a minimum, my formerly jovial and outgoing demeanor replaced with a quiet, guarded one. Each day, I document my interactions with the man in the gray suit. I record the places he appears, the times he watches me, and anything and everything that could possibly help. But I know, deep down, that it's not for escape or for resolution. It's for acceptance. At night, in the quiet solitude of my home, I write in my journal. As I pen down my experiences, a sense of peace washes over me. It's a bitter, haunting peace, but peace nonetheless. I'm being watched, I write. I'm being watched by a man in a gray suit. He's always there, always watching, and I can't escape. 
but I've come to accept it. I'm learning to live with his ever-present gaze. It's my reality now. Closing my journal, I glance out the window. As expected, the man in the gray suit stands there, his figure a constant shadow in my life. His presence is a chilling reminder of my situation, yet also a strange comfort.